Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Petra Wolf Bison, Director of AMO's Membership Center, and welcome to uh, uh, today's AMO's webinar. Um, we've been running a series of webinars to support our members through the many challenges of COVID-19, and I am pleased that we had the opportunity to line up today's discussion on the labor relations aspect of things that um, have been coming up for everybody. Uh, we're hoping that um, we have an opportunity to get to the many questions that we've been hearing from our membership and otherwise. Uh, it may not be the, the case, but please uh, use the chat option to put in any questions that you may have and we'll have an opportunity to follow up following the webinar. So I'll just very quickly turn to our pa panelists and introduce them. I'm very pleased to uh, introduce Jane Albright, who is our moderator and panelist. Jane is, the, Jane is the Commissioner of Human Resources and Citizen Service, Region of Waterloo, as well as being the President of AMRA, or the Ontario Municipal Human Resources Association. We also have Mark Mason, who's a partner with Hicks Morley. Stephanie Geronimo, also a partner with Hicks Morley. And Monica Turner, many of you who know through your work, with AMO uh, as the Director of uh, Policy with AMO. I'm also pleased to introduce um, our, a very uh, recent addition to the panel and we're happy you could join, Omo Akintan. I hope I said that correctly, Omo. Um, yeah. Chief, yeah. thank you. Chief People Officer, People and Equity Division, City of Toronto. And uh, Omo will take us through the framework that uh, the city has been working on to go through some of the recent policy changes and many things that they're also dealing with as they adjust to COVID-19. Um, just for participants and our panelists as well, this session is being recorded and we'll make it available on our AMO COVID-19 web pages. If you haven't been there, you will find all of um, the AMO webinars that have been running over the last four weeks. They're free, available for you to view at any time as will this one, we'll hopefully post it within the next two to three days. Our website also has a ton of resources, information coming out from the province feds and your colleagues from across the province. Um, <clears throat> if you have any follow-up questions coming out of today's uh, discussion or any other questions or issues that are arising for you, you can reach out to us at covid19 at amo.on.ca. And before I turn it over to Jane, I also want to thank you, uh, give a shout out to Brittany Ardeal, who is our technical person behind making these webinars run so perfectly. And just to our panelists, I'll have you know that we are just under 500 participants at the moment. So I am done. Have a great conversation and thank you again. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so we're glad to have so many people join. This is clearly a very topical issue uh, as we navigate a very strange climate. We have only been at this for five weeks and I think that the days are blurring into everything. Um, so it's hard to imagine that's all that we've been doing. Um, we wanna make sure that people are getting an opportunity to ask their questions. So we have a Q and A function as well as we'll be monitoring the chat. And for those of you who don't get your questions asked or answered, then we will be responding as we can through those two different channels. As well, uh, we will keep track of them and depending on how many are still left on the docket at the end of the day, we may go to another session or we can get the responses back out through the AMO channels. Um, so uh, with that, I think I'm going to ask Stephanie to go through for us really where we have been so far um, I think that was the plan uh, to get us started off. So I will hand it over to Stephanie Geronimo from Hicks Morley. Thanks so much, Jane. Um, hi, everyone. This is a new format for me, but I will try not to switch around too much here. Um, so to recap sort of where we've come in uh, the short, uh, long feeling time since March 17th. Uh, on March 17th, the Ontario government uh, declared a state of emergency under the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act. That same day uh, was when the first order was issued closing a number of public establishments, including uh, some municipal uh, facilities, including indoor recreation facilities, public libraries, child care centers, theaters, and concert halls. Those orders have subsequently been renewed. 
um, except for allowing uh, the opening of certain child care centers to provide child care for emergency frontline health care workers. On March the 23rd, the government then ordered uh, the closure of all non-essential businesses. And we know that there is an exemption for municipalities, um, but generally speaking, uh, we've seen a lot of municipalities uh, acting um, in the spirit of that order and trying to generally uh, reduce their operations. Um, and many have uh, reduced the non-essential parts of the operations that are sort of coming into the workplace. Um, that same day, there was also a regulation issued to address staffing concerns and flexibility in long-term care homes. Uh, we had an order to deal with staffing in the drinking water and sewage work systems. Um, and then on March 30th, uh, there was the order closing outdoor recreational amenities, so all outdoor playgrounds, portions of parks, recreation areas containing outdoor fitness facilities. Uh, with the exception of maintenance of those parks and facilities. So um, the, all of the lawn cutting and other maintenance work that your parks folks are doing uh, was permitted to continue. Um, more recently, on April 14th, we've had the order that limits employees to working for a single long-term care home. Um, and of course, we've had all of uh, the changes to social benefits. So instead of applying for EI, generally speaking, employees are uh, applying for uh, the CERB or CURB, depending on how you pronounce it, Canada Emergency Response Benefit. Um, and so we'll talk about that a bit more uh, in a few minutes. Um, but one thing uh, to note off the bat, as you probably know, is that the uh, Canadian employer wage subsidy does not apply to municipalities. Perfect. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to start um, by saying what I, I think Peter had kind of talked about at the start. There's, we're going to try and cover as much as we can. We're going to try and go as in-depth as we can. Um, obviously, we won't probably cover each and every question, each and every nuance, and, and the individual circumstances of any case. Um, will obviously, you know, uh, be quite informative. It may significantly change the, the view. So rather than get tied up for 10 or 15 minutes on a particularly narrow issue, um, if you have a question that looks like that, we will commit to, to getting back to you and, and talking that through. Um, but for now, uh, one of the things I want to talk just briefly about, and, and I, I think it's only relevant still because um, surprisingly, while we're seven weeks, uh, sorry, five weeks into this, um, some people still have a lot of their employees working at home. Uh, others are just starting to uh, really think about what that means and whether there is meaningful work there. And a couple of issues that we wanted to flag uh, for you was um, what policies and procedures do you have in place for doing that? I know a lot of municipalities um, rushed, as a lot of private sector did, um, rushed out of the gates to try and get people out of the workplace as fast as possible and and set up remote working locations. Um, the question though is, is what do you have in place that's actually uh, governing that uh, working relationship? Obviously their existing uh, terms and conditions of employment would still be applicable, um, but the question is, is, do you have a policy in place? Do you have an agreement in place that effectively uh, incorporates that, but uh, builds on it, for example? Um, one of the other things is, you know, have you talked about what the alternative workplace looks like, the security features of it in terms of your information, in terms of employer equipment, uh, in terms of files, uh, documents that might be around, what does that look like? Um, and, and commitments from the employees that they will uh, ensure the confidentiality and the protection of your equipment um, and information. Uh, hours of work is a big one. Um, you know, I think everybody can, can acknowledge that uh, when they work from home, it doesn't go from, you know, 8.30 or 9 o'clock in the morning until 5 o'clock at night without interruption. But, you know, our, our, our workplaces generally don't have that either. They're just different interruptions and different reasons. Um, so I think being up front and acknowledging what the expectations are of employees is going to be important. Obviously, you want employees checking in. You want them engaged. You want them communicating with their colleagues and all of those things um, on a go-forward basis. Where we've been getting some questions, um, not many, but some questions around, uh, you know, WSIB 
um, health and safety, those types of things. And obviously, you know, the employer employees are still governed by WSIB. The employer still has an obligation with respect to that. And, and around policies and procedures, they still have to be followed. Forms still have to be filled in. Um, but some, some language in your agreements around the work from home uh, arrangement can help in terms of making sure that employees understand that the alternative workplace has to be uh, ergonomically suitable and that it has to be a safe environment and that they work with the employer to make sure that that, that, that happens. Um, so those are kind of some of the, the brief kind of issues around work from home that I think people just need to be um, aware of um, and conscious of. I, I see there's a, a question that's come in with respect to uh, T2200 forms. Um, I'd love to tell you that I know what that is. I have no clue. Um, but we have uh, three or four people in our, our pension benefits group who uh, I can get an answer for that fairly quickly and we can get that out to the group. So that's kind of the, the work from home um, type of scenario. The next thing that I want to move into um, before I turn it back over to Stephanie is uh, the ESA uh, amendments and the, the declared emergency leave, the infectious disease emergency leave, uh, some people just call it the emergency leave. I always refer to it as the Dell leave, even though I'm capturing both parts of it. Um, and so, you know, this has been in place now uh, for a little bit, but in many ways, it's still uncharted and untested territory. So if anyone tells you that they've got the definitive answer on this of when it applies, when it doesn't apply, um, and how you can use it, uh, there hasn't been any cases on it yet. So nobody has a, a definitive answer. Uh, I think we've all been going with what's the best information available, uh, what are the risks of each alternative, and, and what, are the, um, what are the other issues that you're dealing with? And you, you kind of have to weigh all of those together and figure out which path you're prepared to go down. Um, at its core, there are effectively two parts to the, to the declared emergency leave, um, uh, or the IDEL as well. There's the first part, which is basically I always say that it's kind of like the workplace has been shut down, the work has been shut down as a result of um, the emergency uh, order. So an order under the EMCPA. Uh, that's kind of the first head of this. The second part of it then is uh, the more um, case specific type analysis. You know, is there um, an order directly affecting the employees, the employee under medical supervision um, or investigation? Um, have they been ordered uh, to isolate or to quarantine? Um, but the most frequent one that we probably see coming up uh, is around the childcare obligation. Um, and it's specifically uh, referenced within that uh, due to childcare uh, child obligations for school or daycare closures. So those are kind of the broad, and, and you know, um, it's, it's set out within the legislation of what those, what those look like in general. The question is, is how have employers been applying it? And it's been a broad range of approaches in terms of what we've seen in our practice. Some employers have taken it uh, very uh, and, and read it very narrowly and have been very limited in the use of um, the declared emergency leave. And others have taken a more moderate view where they have uh, essentially said that, listen, this looks more like a layoff, but if the employee um, thinks that there's an entitlement to a dull leave, uh, please come forward and let us know and we'll look at that. And then there's other employers that have read it much more progressively and more with the, I would say, the broad spirit of, um, of the intention, which was if, uh, if an employee doesn't have work available for any one of these different reasons or isn't able to attend work for any one of these different reasons as a result of the, the COVID um, virus in general, then that should open up some eligibility for this type of leave. And uh, so it's just a matter of where on the spectrum employers have been with respect to their comfort level of risk. There's been questions raised around, can we force employees on to Dell? Uh, it's, a, it's a personal leave under the ESA. So on a, on a strict interpretation, forcing someone onto a leave doesn't sound uh, like it would fit. But at the end of the day, the risk, uh, is probably minimal in that the Dell leave is actually the better option for most employees in most circumstances. And so, um, you know, again, it's a balancing of the risk factors uh, versus the situation that you're dealing with and trying to, to manage many different employees in the workplace. Unionized versus non-unionized makes a big difference uh, as well in terms of what's available. 
um, and whether you're dealing with bumping and layoff language. So um, those are kind of the general issues that are there. And, and I'd love to tell you we have the magic potion to understand exactly when everything um, should be used. But the reality is, is it, it doesn't exist at this point. There's, there's different times you're going to use it. There's different times you're going to say this isn't available. Um, and, uh, and we're going to go the layoff route. Um, one question that I had posed to me is, is effectively, can an employee change their mind later if they've elected uh, the Dell leave? Um, and it's like any other statutory leave in that if, there's, if the circumstances have changed and the leave is no longer uh, something that's applicable to them, uh, then yeah, the employee would be entitled to come back to work. Of course, that's predicated on the fact that there's work available and the reason they weren't off in the first place didn't have anything to do with not having the work. So um, very nuanced and, and kind of technical areas there as well. So I think I'm gonna, we'll come back to this because I think um, almost discussion with respect to City of Toronto is probably gonna pick up on some of these issues. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it at that point for now and uh, turn it back to, to Jane and Stephanie. Jane, I we've had a few we've had a few questions come up on the on the leave and they're quite specific. So we're going um, we're just going to keep going for a bit. Stephanie, over to you to talk a little bit more about some of the other questions that have arisen um, in terms of the new regulations around redeployment. Um, so just before we get to redeployment. You want me to go to redeployment now, or did you want oh, me to? Oh, I clearly to missed a memo that? somewhere. So whatever we would planned on doing, that's what we'll do. No problem. Uh, just so that we sort of have the framework out there before I turn it over to Omo to talk about the, the City of Toronto's experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just gonna run over a few of the uh, the general, general information with regards to EI and uh, the CERB. Um, benefits that are out there now. Um, a few people have asked if the wage subsidy applies to libraries, uh, which is an excellent question that uh, surprisingly I have not received before uh, this webinar. Um, so we will have our pensions and benefits experts look into that and get back to you um, because I don't want to uh, guess. Um, so as you likely know at the moment, uh, if an employee uh, is unable uh, to work or, or doesn't have work to do, um, is not receiving income because of COVID-19, then they do not apply for EI right now. Uh, they apply for the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. So it's $500 a week, so $2,000 a month. In order to be eligible, um, the employee has to earn less than thousand dollars per month um, or pardon me no more than a thousand dollars per month in income um, and there are some other eligibility requirements that to be over 15 years of age they have to have earned five thousand uh, dollars in 2019 or the previous 12 months um, and in terms of who can apply for it, again, it, it's quite broad. Uh, you don't need to have an ROE on hand in order to make that application. Uh, it's streamlined to get uh, dollars into the pockets of employees as soon as possible. Um, so uh, employees go online and the way that the application process works, uh, it's a set four week blocks um, that the $2,000 is paid Four. So the question is, have you, uh, is there 14 days uh, where you are not working or receiving income um, and that you will not receive over $1,000 uh, over the four week period? Um, and then there is particular days of the week, depending on when your birthday is, that employees are to apply either through Service Canada or through the CRA. And there's uh, links on the web to direct employees to the correct um, uh, organization to or website to apply through. Um, the, the CUR benefit is taxable. Um, you don't pay taxes at the time, but you uh, will pay taxes when it comes to be tax time. And if employees were not actually eligible for it, then they'll have to pay it back at that point. 
Um, in terms of top up at this point, um, there has been no announcement saying that employers can top up. So uh, while under EI, you can apply for a sub plan and have a top up at this point, you cannot top up curb. Um, we are expecting to get some clarity on that. Uh, I believe I heard this week, um, but don't quote me on that. Um, hopefully the, the federal government will provide some clarity because certainly lots of employers have been wanting to do that. Um, and the very latest that was just announced this morning by the federal government is that there's going to be a new Canada emergency uh, student benefit. Uh, so students and particularly post-secondary students will be able to receive $12.50 per month from May to August. Um, and that will begin on May the 1st. So we're expecting legislation to come down and regulations with regards to that. Um, so that's sort of the broad brushstrokes in terms of it. Um, I guess the only other thing to mention is that it's not income tested, uh, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. So uh, if an employee is part-time, for example, and would have earned less than $500 a week, they'll still get the $500. Um, if under EI they would have received more, uh, they'll still only get $500 uh, per week. Um, and uh, you can still apply for EI though for uh, things like pregnancy and parental leave. Okay, Jane, I think it's back over to you. Okay, so uh, we have some discussions around the new reg that came out last Friday um, that allows people to uh, redeploy in um, a much less fettered way than we have in the past. Um, Mark, maybe you can talk a little bit about the new regulation and then, then we can hear about how that has played out in the City of Toronto, which has one of the most complicated schemes um, anywhere to be found. Yeah, uh, um, I'll, I'll, type, I'll type, I'll touch on this briefly um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Omo who can, who can give you some real um, life example of, of how this has uh, come to be. So this came down uh, last Friday morning, I believe, and um, we had anticipated something happening. We didn't know what that was going to be. Uh, in, in many ways, it kind of patterns uh, the earlier orders that have come down with respect to long-term care, um, hospitals, water, uh, but it is a very um, specific list of items uh, or areas, I should say, critical services within the municipal sector um, that have been targeted for this. Um, obviously, the maintenance of municipal long-term care homes was one that's important to a lot of municipalities. Uh, waste management and sanitation would be another area. Um, there's several aspects of this that are captured in other uh, regulations that have previously come down around public health and, and water and wastewater. Uh, public transportation operated by the municipality was another one. Um, the administration operation of funding of child uh, programs, uh, enforcement of bylaws, and then the kind of uh, undetermined uh, critical service of services related to the implementation of the municipality's emergency plan. So we've had uh, questions around all of these in terms of understanding the scope of what this means. Again, obviously this is untested. Uh, will depend a little bit on what the level of risk is uh, that the municipality wishes to approach. Uh, I think it's clear that there's certain areas of the municipal operations that are not going to be captured by this, or at least aren't on first glance. Um, but it depends, again, what each individual municipality has adopted as well as part of its emergency plan. Um, what you have gained in, in terms of those uh, critical services then is the ability to uh, move staff around to address your needs in a way that may not have been uh, readily available to you previously um, under your collector agreement language. Now, it still has to be uh, reasonable in the circumstances with respect to what you're trying to achieve, um, but there's, there's language that allows for the redeployment of staff, the changing of assignments of work, uh, including the use of non-bargaining unit personnel, changing schedules, work shift arrangements, uh, deferring vacations uh, and other leaves, um, using volunteers to perform work if necessary. So there's a lot of flexibility that's built into that with respect to those critical services uh, that are captured. Obviously, if you have a union, 
Uh, there's a requirement with respect to 24 hours notice. There was also a letter that went out um, to the municipal heads of council uh, from the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, which talked about kind of the policy initiatives behind it um, and looking to effectively work collaboratively with uh, our labor leaders and um, to try and deploy staff in a way um, that's effectively as fair and reasonable as possible. Um, so that's kind of the broad strokes of, of that um, order that's come down. And I think probably at this point, it makes the most sense to have uh, Omo talk to us about the experience at the City of Toronto and what the city has done. Um, I, my understanding is that negotiations had started well before that, but uh, also in light of that order, um, which may be of interest to, uh, to those on the line. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm going to echo, I guess, start by echoing some of the comments that you made about like nobody has all the answers, including us, but we have tried our best to interpret this in the way that makes the most sense in our context to our um, for our employees. And as Mark also said, we had started the negotiations with our unions um, a while before the executive order. In fact, the order came on the eve of finalizing the agreement. So we spent the last um, 12 hours or so trying to figure out how to incorporate that into um, into the, the the language in the agreement. So essentially um, uh, what we were looking to do, our priority has been redeployment. We have some significant staffing pressures in perhaps the same divisions that most municipalities are having the same challenges with. Our long-term care homes, our shelter um, shelters, are the two areas where we've really had staffing pressures. So trying to negotiate a way to redeploy as many people as we need to into those divisions. And then also there is the question about what do we do about the people who we, we do not have redeployment opportunities for or people who declined redeployment because that had been a challenge that we've had over the previous few weeks is people were turning down redeployment opportunities and there was no consequence to, to doing that. So what we negotiated with our, with our unions was an agreement that will that will extend right into until 30 days after the later of the the revocation of the Ontario declaration of emergency and also the Toronto declaration because we wanted to acknowledge the fact that the declaration might be revoked in Ontario but we might still have issues in Toronto so that's it in terms of scope and then the way the process is working and it's already started we started implementing it yesterday so what we have done which is contemplated in the agreement is that we have sent a survey out to our employees, employees who are in services that have been discontinued or services where we don't require as many people. So employees who are at home not, not, not working or not doing much have received a survey and it gives them 48 hours to make an election. So the employees can elect to, can opt out of redeployment. So they're not interested in redeployment, in which case they will be placed on a Dell and the employee will be placed on the Dell, and which will provide them with access to their benefits. And also, based on what we understand from OMERS presently, that that will also give them entitlement that would be eligible time under OMERS. And so they could buy back or continue to contribute to the OMERS pension. And obviously, we will pay our contribution. So that's an option. Employees who opt into redeployment, we then have the option to, um, to assign them to one of the jobs that we have available. In addition, we have, um, we have the opportunity to use volunteers and the agreement pretty, our agreement in a lot of ways um, mirrors the executive order in terms of the flexibility that it gives us. It does require us to look at seniority, which of course we, we, we're, we're happy to do, but it does also anticipate that there may be circumstances in which it is just not practical for us to do so, in which case we reserve the right to re re rely on the executive order where it applies. It allows us to defer council leaves. Um, so those are basically in broad strokes, the agreement which um, mirrors again, the executive order. So the way that it's been rolling out is employees then have the opportunity to opt, if they opt in, we reach, we, the, the survey also asks questions about accommodation needs. And so we're working through those accommodation needs. Obviously we've got quite a number of them. And um, as of this morning, when I looked, I think, there was, um, there was, I think, 42% of the people who had re responded had indicated a need for accommodation. So that's quite the body of work for us to work through over the next little while. And so for employees who we are not able to redeploy because we don't have enough opportunities for them to do, 
um, we will be placing them also on Adele, and in that case, they will be provided with a top up. So we have registered three sub plans with the province, with the feds, federal government over the last couple, of three over the last two days. I think they were approved yesterday. We may have filed for them on Monday and received approval yesterday, so they were very quick in responding. And the intention is for those employees who were not able to redeploy or employees who were not able to accommodate in redeployed roles will get access to a, a sub payment up to 75% of your income. So. Um, those are the, that's, um, we, we did um, on the last day as we were finalizing the agreement, start to contemplate the issue with the EI and CERB because the expectation is that the employees would go on, the e, on EI and then they would get a top up. But it, it was becoming um, common knowledge by the end of last week that the government seemed to be processing even EI applications under CERB. And so the agreement contemplates that if the guidelines change such that a CERB um, we can pay a top up on a CERB that the employee that we the employees who go ha are required to go on a CERB because EI is not being approved will get the top up for top up for that. And um, I know that there are some other municipalities who have already started to advocate with the federal government about the change in the CERB um, to allow it to, to accept top ups as well. And so we have also joined in that advocacy and I know Edmonton is really active on that. And so we're, we're, we're advocating for our employees who may be required to go on a SERP to get the, to be able to get the top up. So um, with respect, so basically the, the, we continued with the framework agreement as that we had been negotiating and then put in additional language just to contemplate the fact that there may be times when we do not, we, want to rely on the emergency order because it gives us even more flexibility than the agreement that we negotiated. So those, those are the things that, those are the broad strokes that I intend to, call, to cover, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Or Mark or Jane, if I've missed anything that you want me to speak to, I'm happy to cover it. No, I think, the, I think you've hit the, uh, the highlights of, of what it is and <clears throat> the use of the Dell leave and, um, and, and those kind of things. So uh, I think that's uh, a very good high level summary uh, of where things sit on that. Um, I'm just seeing the list of questions that are coming, coming in. <laughs> I'm not sure where to start, Jane, any, uh, any ideas? Well, I think, um, I think one of the first questions is uh, the top up is not a common thing, um, but that was top up on EI. Um, is pretty much what I'm hearing, Omo? Yes, that the intention, yes. Yeah. So it is set up to go, because our employees who are putting on the Dell should be eligible for top for EI. If they get EI, then they would get the top, the top up. If they are not, if they do not get EI and they're put on the CERB, they won't, right now, they wouldn't be eligible for the top up because the rules don't allow for it, but we're hoping that the rules will be changed so that they will be able to get the top up. Okay. Um, I think some of the other questions related to leave, not so much on um, on what people are doing. The one the one caution I would have, and given that you know the 555 people on this call are all HR people, um, is you have to live with your unions when you go back. Um, so being very judicious and having those negotiations up front, as Omo had started, is really important to make sure that you have a really good dynamic to go back to. Uh, when all of this is over and things start to go back up. Um, the other question that seems to be very prevalent uh, is, are people allowed to mandate people to take vacation? Um, and will that vacation potentially impact uh, keeping things? So the, the one question was about whether people could use one day um, to boost their income as long as it stayed under $1,000. So maybe a bit of a discussion around, we've talked about CERB, we've talked about Dell, um, alternatives uh, like using vacation, particularly as you're negotiating with your unions might be a helpful segue because there seem to be quite a few questions there. So I don't know, Stephanie or Mark, who'd like to take that one? Uh, I'll jump in because I typically um, speak fastest and then I'll give Stephanie time to think of what the right answer should be. Um, <laughs> in general though, when you're dealing with employees in vacation, obviously it's a big difference if you're dealing with unionized or non-union employees. Uh, with non-unionized employees, you have a little bit more flexibility as the employer to be able to mandate when vacation gets scheduled 
um, and to, to require employees to use up those banks prior to going on to uh, a leave or prior to layoffs. Um, now, an employee obviously has the rights to their statutory leave, and if they assert that they want to use their Dell leave um, and not use their, their banked up vacation, that could be a bit of a problem in terms of your, your, your route of going that way. And you also have to be careful of the fact that um, some of your employees will have uh, vacation plans that are already scheduled for later this year that may be very disruptive to them uh, if you're going to force them to take their vacation now. So obviously, you have to look at those kind of nuances on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, with unionized employees, you have to look to the collector agreement and any sort of past practice argument as to the ability to force employees to take their vacation. Um, but in the absence of something uh, that requires, uh, you know, the scheduling of vacation and consent with the employees or the employees getting to pick without the employer having um, rights in that regard, then you can, and you have flexibility with respect to that. And, the, and the, if you're operating under the order, um, it gives you flexibility in, in terms of dealing with those uh, pre-scheduled vacation and, and language under your collective agreement as well. Awesome. Um, and then just to add on that, in terms of the, uh, the CERB, I'm just gonna read uh, the eligibility requirement. Um, it's for employee, workers who have ceased or reduced working for reasons related to COVID-19 for at least 14 days within the four week period in respect of which they apply for the payment and do not receive in respect of those 14 days over $1,000 in income for employment or self-employment, EI benefits or pregnancy or parental benefits under a provincial plan. Um, so it certainly, uh, it, it does contemplate having reduced uh, working. Um, and so I think to the question of can you, um, can you place someone on vacation uh, for a day and, and just ensure that they're under, um, it, it seems to allow for reduced um, work and uh, earnings up to $1,000. So. Mark, unless you have a different view on that. No, no, I'm, I'm good with that. I'm just, I was starting to look ahead to, to a couple of the other questions around, um, you know, CERB and EI, that obviously CERB is the route that, that we've been told is, is the route people are going to go. Um, no, there hasn't been any change that we're aware of yet with respect to the top-ups of that. I think uh, what I'm almost speaking to the fact was um, that if and when top-ups become available, that 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 triggers uh, obligations within their agreement, but until that happens, uh, effectively, it's a dormant kind of provision. I think that's that was correct, isn't it, Omo? Yes, it is. Yes. So it contemplates that if that becomes an option, then it will be applied. But if it doesn't, then it there's not that's outside of our control. And just for those people who don't know, Omo, how many employees were you dealing with at, at the City of Toronto, approximately within these? Uh, two agreements. Sorry, how many employees are covered by the collective agreements? Yeah. Um, about 20,000. 20,000 plus. And there was a question about how many employees have been redeployed so far. About almost 500 have been redeployed so far and about 2,000 employees got the survey yesterday. And the other question that came up, Omo, was did you survey your part-time staff as well for this, or is this limited to full-time staff? We surveyed our full-time staff and some of our part-time staff, yes. And the other question is, were there, um, and this is probably me inserting my own language, but, um, you know, is there, um, were there any concerns around redeployment if people refused? Right. If people refused redeployment, was there any differentiation in treatment or was yeah. it, you know, was it different? Yes. So employees who, and I don't know if I was clear on that before, employees who decline redeployment, employees who opt out of redeployment or who turn down assignments when we um, call them to offer them one, do not get the top up. So they go on the Dell, they get the benefits and their OMERS contribution, but they do not get the top up. So the top up is only available for employees that we are, that have put up their hands for redeployment where we're not able to give them find them an opportunity. And of course, the other, the other, the other big thing too is, is 
um, they're not getting the opportunity to continue to work their their normal hours at their normal rate of pay and and um, you know be able to keep their income whole either. So um, I think moving on in the interest of time, um, one of the questions that we we had contemplated was what happens if an employee refuses redeployment? What are the options for union and non-union staff? And so I guess this begs the question, um, if people refuse redeployment, is it possible to mandatorily redeploy people into the workplace, into critical services? So if we're looking at um, the redeployment order, uh, the test is, is it reasonably necessary to prevent the spread of COVID-19? Um, so in part, a lot of it is going to depend on how you can respond, um, is gonna depend on why are they refusing. So is the employee, is this someone who's been working from home up until now, and now you're redeploying them into a uh, critical service that requires them to be uh, coming into the workplace, for example. Maybe by working from home, they've been able to manage their childcare obligations, but to actually leave the home, they now can't. Um, so your response there is obviously going to be different um, and you're going to have to think about, uh, you know, would you then just place them on an infectious disease emergency leave uh, because they'd be entitled to that uh, because of the closure of daycares and uh, uh, schools that's preventing them from doing their work. Um, would they potentially uh, be entitled to childcare uh, through the essential services uh, childcare options? Um, is there childcare in the area through that option? Because I know uh, some employers that I work with up in North Ontario, um, there isn't that many childcare options that have been out yet for that. Um, are they physically able to do the work? So again, the accommodation issues that OMO's been dealing with, uh, are, you have to think those through in terms of human rights. Um, and, uh, you know, are they in one of the other high risk groups uh, that have been identified by public health. Um, and then how do, you, how do you deal with that? So we have to remember that while the order um, does allow you to go around the collective agreement and it says it doesn't apply to other statutes, there's still gonna be overriding human rights uh, concerns that you have to uh, consider, uh, including family status. Uh, um, if the employee is uh, refusing to do the work because they think that it's unsafe, um, then that becomes a work refusal through the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Um, and so the process, and I will admit that my knowledge of the work refusal process is very high level, um, but my uh, knowledge of it is that you can ask another employee uh, to do the work as long as they're advised that there's been a work refusal. Uh, you need to have your joint health and safety committee investigate. Um, and if the employee still refuses after that, then you call the Ministry of Labor to investigate. Uh, and Mark and I were talking about this yesterday, and I think both of our uh, responses after that are that you call Rob Little or Nadine Zacks of our office that are all over uh, Ocean Beach, that are far more knowledgeable of them <laughs> than we are. Uh, the other things that you can do is obviously if you're negotiating something with the union, um, you can do something like the City of Toronto has done. Um, you can also look at, you know, do the employees then go on leave or um, do they have bumping rights and can you restrict bumping rights if you've got that uh, negotiated? Sorry, Mark, you yeah. No, it's fine. Before we move on, there's a couple other um, kind of quick questions that I've seen that I, I would want to clear up. Um, one was, can an employee apply for CERB if they go on disease emergency leave? The answer to that, I think, is clearly yes, they can do that, um, as long as they otherwise meet the, the qualifications. Um, someone had asked, uh, did I hear correctly, top up on Dell or EI? Uh, it, isn't really, um, it isn't really framed properly the right way. It's, it's, if you go off on the Dell leave, the emergency leave, the original entitlement would be to EI, in which case there was top up provisions for that. The government since uh, changed that and it's not an application for EI anymore, it's for CERB. And at this point, uh, there is no provision allowing for top ups. However, you know, it's something that's still uh, being talked about uh, quite heavily. 
Um, in terms of other things I wanted to touch on quickly, one, um, you know, with all the discussion that's existing uh, with respect to long-term care, uh, that's a significant interest for, I think, many on the phone. Uh, some of, of the municipalities and representatives on the phone uh, are on the conference uh, might not have responsibility for long-term care, and so it may not be as much of a pressing issue for them. But for some, um, they've been really wrestling with these concepts. And, and just to remind people that uh, with respect to the uh, emergency order um, 157 slash 20 that came out, um, I believe it was last week, uh, the days are all blurring together again. Um, but there's obviously an obligation now with respect to single employer uh, type scenarios uh, under that order and obligations for the employees to uh, be advising um, all of their employers uh, with respect to uh, who they're working for um, and the obligation going forward that they're only going to be working um, in the one long-term care uh, facility. And so the issues that, uh, you know, obviously one, the dates have passed for those two things to be happening. So for people to be aware um, of those, uh, you as an employer have an obligation be asking for that information and making sure you have that information. Um, employees obviously have an obligation to be following the order. Uh, we have not seen or felt or heard the impact yet of that because one of the consequences obviously if an employee is working part-time at two or three different facilities is now they're not going to be. And so the staffing impacts are going to become potentially more significant for some. Um, there's been talk out there about whether employers should be looking at uh, premium payments. Uh, I'm not going to comment good, bad, or otherwise, but obviously um, that's one of those things where, where employers, in my view, have to be very careful uh, with respect to that because we've all lived through or at least heard the experiences of, of you know, 369, retention pay, 24-hour shifts, um, various things that have happened within the fire sector where one municipality or two or a group decide to do something and, and you know, all, all boats uh, rise uh, with the tide kind of scenario. So. Um, just things to be very careful about, but I wanted to touch briefly on that because I think that's one of the areas um, where municipalities who have long-term care are going to be looking uh, for redeployment options uh, probably at the earliest. Um, I think that was that in terms of um, long-term care. I haven't taken a quick swipe through the questions. Um, one thing I'll, I'll touch on before we kind of loop back and try and answer as many questions as we can it seems very bizarre uh, 50 minutes into this conversation and five weeks into this experience to start talking about uh, return to work, but it's happening out there. And while some municipalities are still clearly trying to figure out which employees they're going to lay off, uh, whether there's Dells available, is there going to be top ups? How are we dealing with, with OMERS? Others, have proactively started to look at what's this going to look like in a few more weeks and how are we going to put this puzzle back together. Um, and so I raise that just to say as much as you're doing your various plans and uh, your contingency arrangements with respect to possible staffing cuts, I don't think that it's too early to start having the discussion of, okay, when we need to put this back together, what's that going to look like? And you know, Jane's point earlier was, you know, you've got a long-term relationship with your union leadership. Um, if you've uh, taken a very aggressive approach throughout uh, your way down the curve in terms of staffing, uh, when you start to come back up the curve, your reception that you receive may not be as positive um, to try and do some of the things that you're going to need to do. You're going to need to look at, you know, workplace <clears throat> screening and, and safety precautions. Um, you know, the, the social distancing within the workplace. Are we having alternative shift arrangements? Uh, are we bringing employees back on a graduated kind of basis? Um, do we have enough supply right now to be able to do it? What have we done to, workplace in to the workplace in terms of, you know, professional cleaning or sanitization prior to employees coming back? Um, do you want to have some sort of social engagement uh, process? Uh, you know, a, a welcome back type of scenario for employees to recognize um, the hard work that they put in. So I think there's a lot of things that municipalities need to start looking at in terms of being ready for that. Obviously, you don't have to have your plans all ready to roll out next week because I don't think anybody's suggesting it's going to happen that fast. 
but um, a lot of the stuff that you're gonna need to start planning for aren't things that can be done overnight. And it isn't just a matter of flipping the switch in reverse to what you did um, kind of uh, in terms of reducing employees within the workplace. So that was probably the only other kind of comments I wanted to make in terms of um, the pre-planned agenda. So I'm, I'm not sure what's kind of next being in terms of pressing issues. That so I think there's a, there's a couple of questions. There's a few things that are trending with um, looking at the wage subsidy program and the fact that municipalities have generally not been able to avail themselves or not even generally, we're not allowed to avail ourselves of any of those wage subsidy programs. But there are some questions around other entities like public libraries. And my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is that it's the source of funding. If it's a municipally funded organization or a publicly funded organization, there is an eligibility. So if you were talking about a public library, it would depend on the source of funding as well as the board constitution. So maybe talking a little bit about places where it might be applicable, if we could talk about that. Um. I am not, uh, Mark and I are definitely not experts in the pensions and benefits area. Uh, we have folks in our office that are, um, and so I will admit that I did not uh, get myself up to date, um, I have anything in front of me here with regards to the wage subsidy program because it didn't, doesn't apply to municipalities. I know the exactly. question come up about libraries, um, and uh, I think I mentioned earlier, I haven't actually surprisingly been asked that question before today. So we will definitely uh, look into that. Um, I don't, what you're saying makes sense to me. I don't know if that is the answer or not. Um, so I, I think that I will defer to asking uh, my colleagues and then we will certainly ensure that that gets. Uh, we can get that answer back up. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's a really good question. So perfect. So the other question, a little bit on the return to work vein, um, is the question around calling people back um, if they are on temporary layoff, if they get called back before the 13 week time frame, and then they have to be laid off again, does the 13 week start over or is it continuous? Do you, can you build on the two chunks in the timing? Yeah, my understanding of this is Stephanie you can correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding is it's 13 weeks in a 20 week period. So, you know, employee could be laid off for five weeks, be brought back, um, to work because there's work available and then be laid off again, as long as you're not tripping that 13 in a 20 week period uh, or the extended temporary layoff, which is the 35 weeks in a 52 week period, provided okay. that you're maintaining either benefit coverage or there's something else that you've done, which could include the agreement of the employee to extend that period of time. There's a, a very kind of um, prescribed list of things that could be used uh, to, to extend that period of time. I'm just seeing, Jane, some other questions about, you know, Dell with OMERS. Um, let, me, let me clarify this because this may help a few people. Uh, if an employee is on a statutory leave under the declared emergency leave, uh, the information that we have at this time is that that is OMERS eligible time. And we expect that the employee would be able to, um, to make their contributions and the employer would have to match and they have a period of time for doing that. Uh, so, that's how the Dell leave works with OMERS on a layoff under the Employment Standards Act, the general layoff, that is not deemed to be um, pensionable service time. So uh, hopefully that clarifies a couple of the, um, the, the kind of the general concerns that people had. Um, there was another question related to redeployment. And so I'm gonna ask Omo how they handled it in Toronto. And then maybe Mark and Stephanie, you could jump in and say whether there is any specific language in the reg in terms of compensation. If there is a variance between the level of the work and the work the individual is doing, do you top up that individual if it's at a higher level or are people receiving their standard pay regardless of the pay of the work that they are going to be doing during the redeployment? That's a great question. So in our case, if the employee, the employee receives the greater of the two, so either their base pay or the pay for the job that they're doing, and again, I just wanted to echo something that's being said. I think the approach that we took to it is these are our employees and these are our union partners. And when this is all over, we, they will continue to be our union partners and they will continue to be our employees. So in every respect, we were doing everything we could to be as fair to them as we could, because this is not, this emergency is also not what they're doing, nor is it ours. So we were trying to find that balance. So in that case, they get the grade. Okay. 
And so to Stephanie and Mark, is there anything specific about compensation or is that going to be left to people to create their own agreements in the spirit of fairness? So one thing is, is um, uh, I think it's clear that the reality is, is that the employee is going to not suffer any reduction because they've been redeployed in terms of their wage. Um, and obviously they gain the advantage if they're, if they're redeployed to an area that's paying more. Um, one of the big issues um, that's going to come up, and we've seen it more within the hospital sector because there's a lot of uh, premiums that attach with uh, various pieces of work, hours of work, schedules of work. Um, one of the issues that becomes a bit of a live issue in the absence of an agreement with your union partners like Toronto has is what kind of, you know, what terms and conditions still apply. If it's within the same union, obviously it's not as big of a deal, but if you're crossing union lines from one bargaining unit to another bargaining unit, you need to think carefully about uh, what's going to happen with the other terms and conditions of that employee's um, employment. And so compensation is part of it. Hours of work, schedules, those kind of things become a, a, another piece to the, to the puzzle there. Awesome. Well, we're almost at time. And what I think we can commit to is we'll call through the questions and we will see whether or not we're able to respond in a format that makes sense. Um, but I think that there may be a good opportunity to have another session as this progresses, particularly as we, as we start turning our mind to getting everybody back to work. Um, so I want to thank all the panelists, uh, almost Stephanie and Mark, for your insight and your wisdom on this. And uh, as always, we will look to you for guidance on how this folds out, which changes every 15 seconds, so I don't envy your task. Um, but on behalf of Amo, Amra, and Hicks Morley, and everyone, thanks everyone for attending, and we look forward to hearing from you again soon. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.